Right, um, let's get things underway. Uh, thank you for coming along to uh, today's fourth and final uh, seminar, uh, Studying in Japan, uh, in which we have uh, three uh, people who have studied abroad uh, in Japan. Um, they'll be individually briefly uh, introducing their own experiences of uh, studying out there, and then we'll follow that up um, with some questions and answers with myself and uh, you in the audience. Uh, I myself, uh, I'm Tom from the British Council, by the way. I studied uh, abroad in Japan in uh, Hokkaido University um, many a moon ago. Uh, so my, my, my study abroad experience is prehistoric compared to uh, these three young guns. So I'll let them do the, the talking. Uh, and we'll start with uh, Douglas, uh, who studied abroad at Waseda University. So, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Douglas Robertson, and I studied Japanese at the University of Edinburgh, uh, graduating in summer last year. Um, as part of my studies, I was at Waseda University for the period September 2009 to July 2010. Um, as most of you know, the Japanese academic year begins in April, but as the Japanese language programs are pretty foreign orientated, I found most of my fellow students also started in September and then finished in July. Um, as a disclaimer, I should say uh, that I haven't checked the system at Waseda, which of course could now be slightly different to how it was back in 2009-10, but I'm sure that the Waseda folk at the relevant booth will have already clarified any details like this for you. Um, when I was there, Waseda offered essentially two programs for foreign students, the IJLP, which was the Intensive Japanese Language Program, or BEKKA as we called it, or alternatively SILS, which is the School of International Liberal Studies. Um, my American friends, most of whom were transferring credits from Waseda straight to their home university, were mostly on the SILS program, which was some course in Japanese and some in English. But my British friends and I, none of whom were directly transferring credits from Waseda to our respective home universities, were all on the IJLP. This essentially meant that we were studying exclusively Japanese. All our classes were both focused on and taught in Japanese language. Um, if you take a look at this timetable, which I have dug out from my attic, uh, you will see that I have some general Japanese lessons, uh, these ones in the morning, all these pre's one and two, so that's five a week. Um, and then the other more specific lessons are in the afternoons. Um, so it is all in Japanese, but you can see uh, Monday I have listening, on Tuesday I've got some reading, some communication, kanji, um, and pronunciation. Uh, Wasted is very good for pronunciation, I'd say quite pioneering in terms of research with pronunciation. Um, and then also some keigo, uh, which is sort of politeness language and business interaction and, and things like that. So very specified um, courses, which is very interesting. Um, there were eight levels in my time in terms of the uh, general courses, but I do know there was talk of this maybe changing, although last year it hadn't changed. Um, so level one was the easiest and eight was the most advanced. Uh, for example, I got a level four in my initial assessment when I, when I arrived. So in my first term, the autumn term, I was encouraged to take classes at level four. And then in my second term, the spring term, this progressed to level five in general. Um, you'll see from the timetable that in comparison to many British universities where there can be quite an emphasis on self-study and at a later stage of research, Japanese universities are much more on uh, an American model with a lot of contact hours with some days lasting from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., although I seem to have managed to avoid that here. Um, <laughs> I should say that, of course, it is partly the nature of language learning at such intensity that I think results in having this many lessons, and you do notice the benefits. Uh, however, if you have been used to a British university environment where you, know, you can skip the odd lecture and so forth, Japan might constitute a bit of an adjustment in as much as attendance can count for sometimes as much as 30% of your final course mark. So if you attend all your lessons, you've already got 30% of your mark in some cases. Um, I found the courses to be very informative, uh, the teaching to be of a very high standard, and most importantly, I felt we were always being pushed and challenged, especially sometimes compared to some of our other foreign students at other universities. Um, and most importantly, um, this was only half the battle. Um, there were people who just went to lectures, um, and that was all the Japanese they did. Um, but I was almost the opposite. I deliberately avoided my fellow Brits and instead sought out and made quite a few good Japanese friends. Uh, despite all the contact hours, you do find when you arrive in a foreign country, you are confronted with an intimidatingly blank phone book, and you suddenly have a great deal of free time to fill. 
Uh, some of this, of course, you fill with homework, but if you want to retain any love for Japanese, it is, I think, very important to do as many other things as possible. And this is very much the principle by which I lived during my time in Japan. The temptation is, of course, to a degree, to socialize with the other foreign students. Um, I'm sure you've seen it in your own universities, those of you who are at university, um, where foreign students hang around in groups talking in their respective common languages and appearing not to make a huge effort to speak in English and join the general throng. Um, at Waseda, you will generally find you are living entirely with foreign students. And of course, all your Japanese language classes are attended only by foreign students. Uh, the common language amongst Europeans, anyway, does tend to be English. And so when people aren't talking Japanese, invariably they are talking English. Um, this is, of course, great added value if you know, you're German or something and you want to brush up on your English. But to us, it's of little value. Um, at Waseda, however, there are a great many chances for you to mix with the Japanese students. Uh, firstly, I should give some airtime to Niji no Kai, or the Rainbow Society, uh, the function of which I did admittedly misinterpret initially, uh, and which is in fact a social society which both foreign students and Japanese students attend. Uh, they played a key role throughout my time at Waseda, and it was at events organized by them, I think drinks on a summer night in a Tokyo park, that I met the majority of my enduring friends from my time at Waseda. You'll also find that in some classes there are Japanese native volunteers with whom you might work in a pair or a group of three who will help you in the teaching process, uh, for instance by talking you through an essay you've just had back or providing a conversational partner. Um, I should say Waseda is in a great location as well, without trying to sell it too much. Uh, it's within walking distance of lots of useful stations. It's in Shinjuku, not that far from Shibuya, Harajuku, Meiji Jingumae, um, and lots of great places to explore. Um, I think that's something I would do a lot more of, actually, if I did have my time again. I do tend to get rather absorbed in my work, and so I did spend quite a lot of time in my room, especially in the early, earlier time there, uh, working, rather than gadding around and exploring. Um, I thought rather than go into more technical details about the course um, and so forth, a great, which, a great deal of which could be a bit different now, I'd instead, in the last couple of minutes, just take you through a few photos from my blog, which I kept in Japan, and yeah, talk you through them. Uh, so, just a few alternative views of Japan. This is Chichibu Station. Um, one thing I did love doing, uh, ironically, was getting out of Tokyo and going to visit the countryside. Um, this is a photo I took at the station when I went there. Um, on the train, you might be able to see, well, no you won't. It says Ikebukuro, which is a station in Japan, kind of think kind of London Euston S station. Um, and I just thought it was quite fun to think that, that train was going all the way to central Tokyo. This place is called Kyu Asakura Hausu, and you don't have to travel outside the city to find peace and quiet. This place is actually in Daikanyama, which is in Shibuya. It's a very kind of fashionable area of Shibuya, where you know Rihanna goes to get her nails done, things like that. Um, it's just spectacularly quiet and peaceful. It's a complete oasis, and it, I mean, it cost I think maybe 80 yen to get in. Um, I, at, I saw this woman just sitting here, and rather cheekily, just sort of captured her moment of meditation. As it came into quite a nice photograph. Um, I'm also quite into architecture and design, and so I loved architecture around places like Rapongi Hills um, because Japan can often be quite innovative in that particular area. And I never got tired of walking around what I think are pretty staggering buildings. Um, Odaiba, too, is quite a nice place to go. Um, I used to take the little DLR-esque train, it's called the Yuri Kamome, and it sort of takes you over the bridge and, and you arrive in Odaiba, which is all on reclaimed land. And I used to take my laptop there and write my dissertation and sort of cafes, just walking along the river and going cafe hopping. Um, and then another one, there's not a sort of order here, but this is Kawagoe, which is another place I love because there are lots of buildings there. I mean, some of them are new, but some of them are very old buildings. Um, and I thought the atmosphere was quite enhanced in as much as all the power lines are underground, which is actually quite rare in Japan. Often you'll have the sky sort of blotted out by power lines, but they've gone to the trouble of burying them all, so you sort of have a bit more of a, a taste of what it might have been like. Uh, so yes, 10 minutes isn't a great deal of time to sum up what was really one of the most influential years in my life so far at 23. Uh, but I suppose if there's one thing I want you to take away from today, um, it's that I would wholeheartedly recommend that you just go for it and study in Japan for a year, because it was definitely one of the most interesting years of my life. Um, and I've put my Twitter here, so if you do have any questions about Waseda and you don't manage to catch me or you have to rush off, uh, just tweet me or, and, and I'll get back to you. Thank you very much.
Okay, uh, next up we have Josie, uh, who studied at Kansai University uh, down in the west of Japan. Take it away, Josie. Thank you. Hello. Um, I think mine will be slightly less formal than Douglas's because I actually studied in Japan back in um, 2003 to 2004, so it's quite a long time ago, but it's actually had such a huge effect on the rest of my life that I'm still really excited to come and tell you all about it. So, um, about me, um, I actually did the International Baccalaureate in Cambridge, and for that I had to do a language and this is slightly embarrassing because I'm sure lots of you are anime fans and manga fans or you're into judo, judo or karate or have like a really good reason for being interested in Japan. Mine was that I had to do a language and so I chose between <laughs> Russian or Japanese. I didn't really know much about Russian or Japanese so I did eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> <laughs> and that mo seems to have changed my life considerably but I landed on um, Japanese so... Um, after my sixth form time, I went to Japan for a gap year for six months, and I lived in um, three different host families between Osaka and Kobe, and they were so nice to me. They basically treated me like a princess for um, six months, and um, yeah, they just looked after me so well that I felt terrible that I couldn't speak enough Japanese to tell them how much I enjoyed it, and I you know, really wanted to be able to help a bit more and give more back. So um, I enrolled at SOAS um, in London, the School of Oriental and African Studies, and did Japanese and history. And of course, part of that means that you get one year studying abroad. So I went to Kansai University in Japan again. And um, just to let you know what's happened since then, since 2003, I came back to the UK, um, graduated, and then I've spent two years as a Kokusai Koryuin, which is a coordinator of international relations on the JET program. So I worked in NARA, for two years um, for the local government, doing translation, interpreting, organising international events and things. So it was the perfect job. You can't imagine a better job. But I would never have got that had I not had this year in, in Japan. Then since I came back to the UK, I arrived back in 2008, just as the financial crash was sort of making, them, them making all jobs disappear. So I ended up working for Pokemon for a year. So I've got lots of photos of me and Pikachu, but I didn't want to derail the conversation. Um, I also then I worked for the Nikkei, which is the largest financial newspaper in the world. Um, and that's also um, being able to speak Japanese was the only reason that I managed to get that role. And now I work for the Japan Foundation. So you can see that my whole career has been based around the fact that I can speak Japanese and have had interactions with Japanese culture and living in Japan. So yeah, it's not the year or the several years that you spend in Japan are fantastic, but you have to remember what you want to do afterwards and then just you can realize that if you speak Japanese or if you understand the culture a little bit, there are plenty of um, possible um, routes that you can take your career. So then, so if you're thinking about going to Japan, you need to work out where you want to go. I noticed when I was in SOAS, um, when we had to choose which university we wanted to go in our second year, um, most people that had never been to Japan before chose Tokyo, because if you've never been to Japan, everyone's heard of Tokyo. And I'm, actually, I'm not really sure why, but nearly everyone that had never been went to Tokyo. But remember, there are other places. There are fantastic universities all over Japan. I had friends that studied in Hokkaido and loved it. Everyone that ever goes to Kyushu will become a massive Kyushu fan. And, um, yeah, for me, I decided to go back to Osaka, which, to be honest, is probably the best place you could ever go. Osaka is brilliant. <laughs> so if you head to Osaka, the other things to think about when you're choosing your university is, uh, would you like to be in, inside the big city or would you prefer a campus university? Um, Kansai University is kind of a bit of both. It's a massive campus, but it's just north of Osaka City, so it's only about 20 minutes on the, um, on the train, and it kind of turns into a tube. So it's, you're basically within the city, but it also feels like a village. It's just, yeah, a huge campus. Um, as I mentioned, yeah, Tokyo isn't the only option, so don't... Um, obviously, Tokyo does have some amazing universities, but do think about other places too. Also worth considering is how many other ryugakusei there are. Ryugakusei is the word for foreign exchange students. In Kansai University, um, out of the Kōkan ryugakusei, which is the exchange students rather than people that go to the university for four years, so it's people like Douglas and I that just go for one year, and there were 25 ryugakusei students out of 40,000. 
So we were slightly in the minority, which is fantastic if you want to study Japanese, because it meant if we wanted to make friends or go to circles and things, we'd have to speak Japanese. So do consider that. I think my experience was very different to Douglas's in that he had to really search out finding the Japanese people. I had them kind of approaching me because they'd be like, I want to try discussing things with a foreigner, yay. So the other thing to consider is whether you want to live in a dormitory or not. Um, I lived in a dormitory um, for part of my degree in SOAS and with friends in a house. And I have to say, while I'm in the UK, I really prefer living with my friends and having my independence. But while I was living in Japan, I think living in a dormitory was probably the best decision I could have ever made. Um, there were some incredibly annoying things about the dorm. Um, if you live in a dio, which is the old, stall, the old style Japanese dorms, then they might have some ridiculous rules. Ours was actually, um, it was, the, lots of the rules were actually made up by the students. They had their own student councils, so they voted in the ridiculous rules themselves. So for the girls' side of the dorm, we could never have men come into our side of the dormitory. We had like a, an orsorgy once a month where we'd all have to clean the dorm. There were, there, would, there were lots of rules about coming home late or, you know, you, and we had to sit through really long meetings and things like that. So I remember I did have a bit of culture shock for that side of the dorm. But we were living with Japanese students, and so we were using Japanese every day. We had a shokudo, so there was a, a canteen if we didn't want to cook. There were some questionable types of food. Like I think I was, I definitely had culture shock one, one morning when there was pizza for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that wasn't. There was normally a Japanese option as well, which was all good. So, so expect some culture shock, but live, definitely think about living in a dorm if there is one. And yeah, you can normally get over the rules for the the really good experience you'll have. I think all of my close friends in Japan that I'm still friends with, um, oh goodness, many, many years later, were from living in the dorm. I have a few that I met in the university, but it was more the people that you live with that you'll be best friends with. Um, you might end up, sorry, one more thing on the dorm, you might end up with a roommate. I, I've never had that in the UK. If you live in a dormitory here, then you'll have your own room. In Japan, it's very normal, especially for first years, to um, stay together. But I ended up, I'm still really good friends with my roommate. She's the best, she's the best Japanese person in the whole of Japan. Um, yeah, you'll probably have similar experiences. So yeah, do you consider it? Um, these are just a couple of photos of Kansai University. Um, it's massive. This is just like a couple of tiny parts of the campus. Um, and it's just beautiful in all the different... Of course, they plant the cherry blossom trees and there's lots of maple trees, so as the season changes, you really notice it and see all the prettiness. So, yeah. Then um, I thought I should give a few extra tips as well, so if you do go to study in Japan. Um, for money, um, it's actually really good for foreign exchange students. If you go from a university in the UK, then there are loads of scholarships... Um, I actually ended up, I didn't have a scholarship, but I know lots of my, um, my friends from university did get one. Did you get one, Douglas? Yep. There you go. Um, but if you don't get a scholarship, I found that part-time jobs, baito, actually are amazing. In the UK, I would end up um, being on Oxford Street or on Bond Street selling shoes and things and working really hard. In Japan, of course, I was still working hard, but I could teach English at private schools. And um, so I found myself going from sort of about six pounds an hour to more like 13, 14 pounds an hour. So I was feeling quite rich doing my baito in Japan. And um, you get, if you go to the UK, I, I'm not sure if, if it's the same now, the, the fees are so much more expensive. But when I was there, I had a bigger loan while I was in Japan, but I had to pay half the fees to my university. Is that the same for you? So yeah, so I actually was richer in my year in Japan and that meant I could save up for my last year at university so I didn't, so I was, you know, the year when you're writing your dissertation and things, I didn't have to work so much. So yeah, that's very good. Um, for studying, seriously, one of the, I know we're going to tell you all about the amazing parts about studying in Japan but it is actually important to study as well while you're there. Um, I do know a few, one of my predecessors at Kansai University had an amazing time. He was a legend. Whenever we turn up, he'd be like, oh, you're from SOAS. There's this man called Rob. I think he may have been slightly alcoholic, but that <laughs> it just meant he was a legend because all the Japanese students knew about him. So I was quite keen to meet him when I came back to SOAS, but I came back and found out he'd failed. 
because, of course, once he got back for his third year, he hadn't really studied that much. He had amazing bar Japanese, but he wasn't so good at passing <laughs> Tanaka Sensei's tests once he got back to the UK. So, yeah, if my, my, the thing I would recommend is to try and get into the most difficult class that you can and push yourself as much as you can because the only person you're going to be helping is yourself. Um, you'll probably find that you have lots of tests. We always had Monday morning kanji tests, which is probably the most evil um, idea you could ever have, so it ruins every Sunday night because you're like, ah, quick, I've got to get another 40 kanji into my brain. And yeah, so, but I'm glad that I had them because at least now I can read the newspaper and use kanji at work and stuff. Um, travel tips. Um, there's lots of ways you can travel around Japan when you're a student that are very cheap. Of course, making friends with um, Japanese students means when they go home for the holidays, you can always tag along with them and go and stay with their mums, <laughs> try the good Japanese cooking that got me hooked in the first place. Japan has loads of youth hostels as well, so you can stay in very cheaply in places. There's the, um, the trains during the holidays have this magic ticket where you can go as far as you want on um, this, yeah, everyone, I can hear lots of people whispering the same choo choo. It's like a, it's a, it's meant to be a young person's ticket, but basically it works during the holidays, and you can go as far as you want on a local train. So that's a good way to um, travel very, very cheaply. The other one I used a lot was night buses. So yeah, you can move around cheaply. The other thing that I probably shouldn't tell you, um, but it's very useful, is um, manga kisa. They have um, manga cafes. <laughs> And they have little booths, and I know a lot of you Yugakuseis that when they wanted to stay somewhere cheaply or they wanted to see a festival or something, you'd go, and then you can stay the night in the Mangakisa because they have beds and things. So you pay a 1,000 yen for the internet, and then you go to sleep. So, you know, it's worth knowing. Um, just to tell you a few of my university culture shocks, um, compared to the UK, um, the things that really shocked me most, one was sleeping. I attended both um, Lyugakusei classes, so the, all my Japanese language classes were just with other foreign exchange students. They were incredibly hardcore. They, were all, they really worked as hard, but it meant that we were fluent after a year, so that was good. The classes I attended with Japanese students, because if you study hard enough, maybe in the second half of your year, you might be able to go to normal Japanese students' classes. I was really shocked to turn up to a lecture and then see lots of Japanese students sleeping. And as Douglas said, you get 30% of your mark for just turning up. So they'd turn up, and then they'd get comfy, and some of them would be asleep. And from, coming from the UK, I was very shocked at that. The same in the library. I think some people would just use the library as a glorified sleeping room. So. Um, the other things I found very strange was um, the songs. Most of the universities you will go to will have their own song. So um, I still, if you go to karaoke in London, there is the Kansai University song in there. So Kansai Daiga, Kansai Daiga. Actually, I'm not going to sing the whole thing, but it, it made me really happy when I found that in the UK. And um, yeah, you don't expect universities to have songs and be all kind of, they all stand up and sing them really loud. And it just made us go, what? I can't believe this is happening. Um, and the last thing is OBs. Um, in our dormitory especially, I, I don't know if you know if you've ever heard of OBs, it basically means old boys. So it's the alumni from the university quite often have quite a large say on what's happening in the university. So it could be really useful because if people, um, if we had parties and things, they might buy us a crate of beer for the dorm. But then I think a lot of the reason we kept the rules that I mentioned earlier that I thought were a bit ridiculous was because the OBs had so much influence. So the current students had the power, but they really wanted to listen to what the OBs were saying, so they actually never really changed anything. So I think things like that are actually quite interesting how different it is from the, um, yeah, from the UK. Lastly, last tips for making friends. I've got some embarrassing photos up there for you. Um, the, my, main, um, my main tip would be to join circles. There's two different types of clubs in Japanese universities. They have the bukatsu, bukatsu, which are the really hardcore clubs. So if you say you want to join a club, they're the ones where you'll probably practice every day. Circles are a bit like clubs, but not so stressful. So if you joined the, um, a tennis club, you'd practice every day and you'd become amazing at tennis and you might end up in the Olympics. Or you could join the tennis club and you just turn up and bash the ball a bit and go, hello, and make friends, and then go to a nomikai, which is like a drinking party. So I would really recommend joining circles. I ended up joining Shodo for writing um, and hiking, a hiking circle, and I had probably 
the best week of my life to date was um, hiking in the mountains in Nagano with my hiking circle. And I'm still friends with all of them. They're such a good group of people. Um, some of these embarrassing photos on the side there is um, our dormitory would have things like we would do um, different presentations, not really presentations, there'd be ridiculous shows for the rest of the dormitory. So we'd get into groups and this was um, some boys dancing to Men in Black. <laughs> um, we also made a zombie movie, that's why there's a photo of me looking a bit like a zombie. Um, I took part in lots of festivals. Taking part in festivals is a fantastic way to meet people in the local community and it's just really fun to dress up and drink a little bit of sake and maybe break your back carrying a mitsukoshi. Um, Christmas is a great time to dress up and um, you know, interact with the Japanese students because they don't grow up with Christmas in the same way as us. So they get very excited by people dressing up as Rudolph and Santa and things like that. Um, and school visits. If, if you're in a Japanese university and you're one of the foreign students, you might stand out a lot. So we would be invited to lots of things like, can you come and speak at a high school? And so the high school children can meet you. And then, so you, you basically meet them, you have a nice chat, and then they write really cute letters to say thank you afterwards. It's, it's really worth it. And um, then, yeah, getting involved in the community, there's things like the photos in the corner are, um, we were making mochi. So it's, it was basically lots of old ladies. I have no idea how old they are because they were, they were probably over 90, but you can't tell. They were, they were really young and Genki looking, but they, it was us and the old ladies making mochi. And these are the kind of things that you just, you can't even imagine experiencing in a university in the UK. So hopefully you guys can all get involved as well. And yeah, it's probably the best decision I've ever made in my life to study Japanese. So, you know, if you can't decide, do eeny, meeny, miny, mo, rig it if you have to, and then go with choosing to go to Japan. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jose. That's fantastic. Um, okay, last but by no means least, we've got uh, Warren who studied at uh, International Christian University, which is in Tokyo. And take it away. Afternoon, everyone. So my name is Warren. Um, and before I start, I just want to say uh, thank you to the British Council and Keio University for inviting me here. Um, and I hope this presentation will help you in some way to make um, your decision to go to Japan or assist you in your preparations. So the world classroom, not the walled classroom. So I feel this title really encapsulates my experience in, uh, that I had in Japan. Um, and this title may not mean so much at the moment, but hopefully you should get a feel of what I'm trying to say by the end of this presentation. So if you choose to study Japanese or if you choose to go to Japan, you'll notice that everyone you'll meet will start asking you, why on earth did you choose Japan? So I, I think I must have been asked this question at least a hundred or hundreds of times by now. So it's always good to be prepared with an answer. Um, and so here's my one. So when I was... <laughs> so when I was 17 years old, it was as though one day I just woke up and... <laughs> I just thought it was my destiny to be a, a Japanese pop or rock star or an anime <laughs> character. And so instead of revising for A-levels, I started to listen to Japanese um, like visual K music every day for about three hours and then um, watch anime in the night and started eating Japanese snacks. Um, the next step for my transformation was to study Japanese language instead of A-levels. Um, I wasn't taking an A-level in Japanese, but I was doing that for a good few hours each day as well. Um, I was doing some online courses. And then finally, as you can see from the pictures, I had a slight change in my appearance. And um, this was my room during my gap year, and it was an absolute mess. Um, I've got posters of Japanese rock bands on the wall. Um, but fortunately, I did spend enough time revising. Um, I got the required grades that I needed to um, receive a deferred offer to Sheffield University to study Japanese and Russian. And so I was free to enjoy my gap year, um, which I planned through the organization Latitude. So this was where I was. So I went from London, so big city, to Nisho, which was a very small city. In the night, there was no lights. Um, <laughs> there was rice fields when I woke up. Um, half of the week, 
Um, I volunteered in the kindergarten. Uh, you can see the top two photos. And I was a teacher's assistant, um, and which means you just essentially play with the kids. Um, in the, <laughs> the bottom half, um, you can see that I was also in an old people's home, and I got to talk about um, lots of interesting um, subjects, whether it be taboo subjects such as the war. Um, and also this woman you can see I'm with, she thought I was about 50 years old when I asked her, how old do you think I am? Um, but but this, this um, was a real life-changing experience. It got rid of my misconceptions that I had about Japan, that everyone was an anime character. Um, and so not only did I get rid of my misconceptions about Japan, but I also got rid of my hair, as you can see. It was in about my third or fourth month there, and I, I was there for six months, so I only had a couple of months to go. And it dawned on me that after going back to England, I wouldn't be able to go to Japan until my third year of university as part of the exchange. So I couldn't have that. I, I was learning so much Japanese just by talking to people on a daily basis. Um, but more than Japanese, I was learning about how to communicate with people. I was learning about Japan by being there. Um, and so I, had, I decided that from that point that I had to be there for my university experience. Um, let me just give you an example about what I could learn about Japan. So if you go and do Japan studies, you learn about it being a group culture, how, how Japanese like to move together. So in the kindergarten, they had a sports day every year um, in autumn. And none of the sports or activities were individual. They were all groups. So they would dance as a group or do lots of relays. Um, and they would all cheer for each other. They were going, Gambare, Faito. And the most surreal moment was when all the kids were celebrating coming in last place. So whether you were first or last, you still had to celebrate. And so I really learned about the group aspects of Japanese culture. So as you can see, it's not just about studying from the books. It's about being there where you can really um, learn and experience Japan. So I, apl I applied to a university in Tokyo, which had courses for international students. Declined my offer to Sheffield. And... Some months later, I began my four-year journey in Japan. So my university was International Christian University, which is also known as the Intensive Care Unit and the uh, <laughs> Isolated Crazy Utopia. Um, it's called the Isolated Crazy Utopia because it's, uh, it's about half an hour by train from um, the centre of Tokyo. Um, it's in a beautiful green campus. Um, and people generally stay within there. So, <laughs> um, but it, it's a, a really beautiful place, and it was a utopia for me. Um, so in my first year as a freshman, so in Japan, the cherry blossoms are associated with endings and beginnings. So the new university years, uh, a new university, well, you graduate high school in March, so the ending, and then you'll start university um, in April, so the beginning. Unfortunately, I didn't enter in April, so I didn't get that as my picture. I was welcomed to ICU by mosquitoes and the, the extreme heat um, and humidity in September. But it was a still a fantastic experience. So what do you do in your first year? Well, the initiation. So each year, the dorm... Josie explained a bit about it, but each year the dorm, often dorms in Japan, they get together and do performances. And so what we had to do was, um, for a week, we had to dress up as um, what, cartoon characters or animals and then go to school like that. And then at the end of the week, we had to perform on um, the main field in ICU. Um, and we performed the DJ Ozma Bounce With Me dance, which is kind of like the Gangnam style, of, but it's in Japan, it wasn't as popular. <laughs> um, other activities you may do uh, in the Freshers' Week are maybe dorm exchanges, so you'll um, go to another dorm and then you'll introduce yourself. It's all very formal. Um, I, to be honest, I did feel like a 14-year-old, because you're sitting down, you stand up, introduce yourself, I'm Warren, and then they ask you questions, and then you, do, then you change your seat and go and talk to someone. So it's all done in a very formal way. Um, but you get used to that after a while, and um, it is very fun. So next, the kraori, or club orientations. Um, so this is probably the most important decision that you'll make during your time in a Japanese university. 
So clubs are central to universities in Japan. Sometimes I wonder, are people going to university to study or are they going to go to these clubs and societies? Um, but it's a central part of your life there. A lot of your, your core group of friends will be made there. Um, so it's worth trying out a few to see what activities you like and also um, if you can get along with the people in there. Um, there are some traditional clubs like karate and baseball which will be very strict with long practices and you'll be doing every day and they'll harass you and scold you if you don't go. Um, other ones are more relaxed and so I joined the Japanese Heart Club and I joined my dorm soccer team. Um, and so I, I felt I got a good balance between the strictness and the relaxed. So for the Koto Club, I was the vice president, but I didn't turn up most of the time. So <laughs> it's, it's worth having a look around. Another place where you'll make um, your closest friends is the dorm. Um, I was very fortunate to be in Global House. I, you get your own room in, in this um, dorm. Other places you have to share with someone else. Um, the uniqueness about Global House is that you, there's half of the residents are foreign students and then half of them are Japanese students. And in each unit, there will be um, four students sharing um, the small apartment. And then there'll be two Japanese and two foreign students. And so I got to make really close friends with the Japanese students, but also the foreign students as well. So I had a roommate from Russia, um, from the States, um, people from Germany, Myanmar. So it's great. You get to learn about the world, not just Japan as well. And this obviously did cause some co um, conflicts due to cultural differences. Um, I had one roommate who didn't clean up, and he was a Japanese guy, and he wasn't willing to talk about it. So you have to kind of um, negotiate these things, um, but it's all part of the experience of being there. And talking to many of the international students who didn't stay in a dorm, many of them felt very lonely, um, or some of them may even have quit going to the university because... Being, being in a dorm is really a home away from home, so I definitely recommend anyone to go to a dorm. So, second year, that's when the work really begins. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this was at the end of my first year in Japanese class. So. <laughs> so, this is what the classrooms look like. So, the teachers would encourage us to get outside and experience the world as part of our studies. So, um, I remember in one Japanese studies class, they said, Tokyo is your classroom. So as you can see, the world became my classroom. So um, in the top left-hand corner is the Mingeikan, which is a um, folk art museum. So for art class, we went there. Um, in the top right, you've got Akihabara. I went there for an anthropology class. Um, and i done research on the otaku culture. Um, in the bottom corner, you can see a shrine. So for the religious studies class, we had to go to a shrine and um, do some observation of the different architecture, etc. And on the ICU campus, they have an archaeology site. Um, and so we got to, every week, we'd have one lecture and then um, one practical class where we would go to the, the dig and we'll be digging up pottery from the Jomon period, which is like the start of Japan. So that was, that was fantastic. So, part-time job, Aruvaito. So, I, many students in Japan do part-time jobs. I think they do it more than here. So, people work in restaurants or convenience stores. One of my friends works in Disney. Um, and often, uh, many of the foreign students maybe do English teachers. But I wanted to do something different. And so, I had a... I had a when I was in London, I'd done an internship at a travel agency. And so, I applied to a travel agency in Japan as well. And it was called HIS. And they offered some tours to foreign students, uh, not foreign students, to um, what, foreigners coming to Japan. Um, it was very much cultural activity. So I got to do some of them as well. So you can see that's actually me in the picture. Um, I dressed up as a kabuki what, performer. So, um, and also, um, I was given the responsibility to take a media group around Tokyo. Um, and then a week before the tour started, apparently Richard Branson was joining the tour. So <laughs> that was very nerve-wracking. But um, the, the, we took them to a sushi restaurant first, and then Richard left after that. And then his mum joined the tour, and we went to a maid cafe. And <laughs> I saw Richard Branson's mother getting fed 
by <laughs> a maid <laughs> in the maid cafe. <laughs> so, yeah. so, third year. So, in Japanese universities, suddenly, um, all the third year students will disappear. So, what do they go and do? They do job hunting. So, where do they go? They won't be in class or they won't be doing club activities. They'll most likely be in their rooms doing online tests for some company or an introduction session somewhere in Tokyo. And when they come out, they're really easy to spot because they all look the same. They'll all be wearing, uh, they'll all dye their hair black. They'll all be wearing plain black suits with a white shirt. Um, everyone will have the same bag. Um, there are hundreds of workers' manuals on how, what you should wear and how you should look, what mannerisms you should have. Um, you can see one of my friends here is making an elementary mistake. He, his tie is red. <laughs> it's supposed to be black, so I don't know if he got a job. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in your fourth year, well, um, well, as you go, you stay there for a, a longer time, you become a senpai. So it's not just in your fourth year, but as a fourth year, you are the, the senior of the university. And it's a completely different experience um, as a senpai. So as a kohai or a junior, you're expected to be obedient to um, the older students, show respect to them by using the polite form of Japanese. Um, but when I became a senior, people suddenly started calling me Warren-san. And you can start ordering people about and telling them what to do. <laughs> so just to tell you a little bit about the senpai and kohai system, if you're maybe late to a club activity, you'll get scolded at by your superiors. Or if you don't use sun, they'll exclude you from the group. So it's, it's one thing to um, take note of when you're there. Um, but as an international student, often the Japanese students don't expect that of you. They don't ex um, expect you to act in the same way. Um, and to be honest, I still am not so used to that system. Um, but while, while you're there, you should definitely take note of it and try as best as you can to adapt to it. So in, in your fourth year, you'll join a ZEMI group, which ZEMI stands for seminar, so it will be your dissertation group. So this is another place where you may um, make some um, a, a core group of friends. Because you, depending on the teacher, you may meet quite regularly, maybe every week, to go over your dissertation. You'll be presenting um, what you'll be doing. And a lot of the other students in your group will have the same study interests as you as well. Um, so you can create good friends for life and academic networks, if you're interested in that. And this is my um, thesis advisor um, in Japanese history, and he's still a teacher at ICU. And fortunately, I made a good friend with him as well. So your fourth year, most of your classes will be finished. Hopefully, you should have either um, finished your job applications or going to grad school. So the whole year, you're pretty much free, apart from your thesis, to have fun. So uchiage means what, like a party at the end of a, um, or a, at the end of a performance or a job well done party. So the whole of my fourth year was a job well done party. So <laughs> I, I went um, bamboo hunting in a prohibited grounds on ICU. I see the ICU president is here, but I think that's okay to say now. There's a prohibited grounds with a bamboo forest, and we went um, bamboo shoot hunting, and then we prepared those after. Um, we also went to Fujiku, um, which is a theme park in Japan, and I also went to lots of eating and drinking parties as well. So that will be your fourth year in a Japanese university. Don't get me wrong, I did study hard and I did graduate. <laughs> <laughs> so that is my graduation picture there. And I'm going to finish on this slide. Lots of Japanese students take graduation trips. So why did I choose this uh, photo to end my presentation? Well, this photo is actually taken in Italy, so what's that got to do with Japan? Nothing. But this slide really represents how I've come to view to Japan. So a big mistake which I made in my gap year was I went there with the other, um, or my other, the partners in the gap year program, 
and they were all international students. And I didn't want to make friends with them that much because I thought, I oh, know, I just want to talk to Japanese people the whole time, eat Japanese food or everything Japanese because I'm in Japan, I want to learn Japanese culture. But I really missed out on a lot in those six months, and I think that was a big reason why I wanted to go there for the rest of the four years because I felt that there was something that I needed to do in Japan. And I was able to rectify that mistake in ICU, and I made friends from all over the world. I still had the Japanese experience, but I made friends from Italy, from Russia, and I learned a lot about the world、um, by going to Japan. So, not just about Japan, but about the world. So, I see Japan now as a gateway to the world. And so, this was my,、um, pic- my graduation trip、um, to Florence, Italy. My friend in the middle there, she's Italian, she lived in a mansion. And then <laughs> it was fantastic. But,、um, That's what I want you to take away from this presentation that two things. One, that when you go to Japan, really get outside and experience it for yourself. Don't just see the classroom as a place to study. And two, see Japan not just for it of itself, but see it as a gateway or、um, an, an, a door to the rest of the world. Thank you. Thanks very much, Warren. I, I prefer the old haircut, by the way. <laughs>、um, right.、Um, let's throw open the floor to some questions from the audience. If you've got a question, can you raise your hand? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the funding situation. When you、um, went out to Japan. I first went to, well, I started university when, in 2007. So the exchange rate at that point was about、um, a pound to 230 yen. And then a year later, suddenly it was a pound to 130 yen. So when I first entered,、um, I, th- I, I was funded by my parents to go to university firstly.、Um, and at that point, it wasn't so expensive for them to、um, send me there. Um, but after that, it became very expensive, and ICU helped out with they have lots of、um, scholarships for international students. And I'm sure lots of other、uh, universities in Japan have、um, scholarships specifically made for international students. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, okay. Um, so, again, at the time that I was applying, there w a s only a few Japanese universities, ICU was one of them, where you didn't have to take an entrance exam.、Um, I think at the time, a lot of the maybe public Japanese universities would require you to take an exam for international students wanting to go and study in Japan.、Um, but ICU just allowed you to give, submit your A level results. Um, and then also a personal statement about yourself. So, kind of similar to、um, the UCAS here.、Um, but I think now, a lot of, with the Global 30、um, movement, which is the Japanese universities want to internationalize, they're creating many more programs、um, and application, making the applications easier for foreign students to enter. So, I think from now on, maybe more of the public universities will allow you just to apply. With your own grades.、Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, down at the front. I have a question for you, Japanese. You said that you worked for all the local places and did translations. Does that mean other? But do you have any formal translation qualifications? Or is it just your degree in Japanese languages that have got you?、Um, I think. When,、um, if you go on the JET program, this isn't really to do with studying, it's afterwards. But、um, if, you, if you're a CIR on that program, quite often they expect you to do translation to start with. So I arrived, and actually, in the first week, they said to me, Actually, we're not going to give you very much work to start with. We should keep it very quiet while you're settling, on, settling in. And then other people would come in and say, Chotto, 
Josie, do you mind? Could you just translate this for me on the quiet? So I actually had a massive pile of translation in the first week. So, um, and a lot of it, if it wasn't translation, quite often it was native checks. So I actually, I think my first couple of weeks, I wasn't very good at translating because I was too shy. And they would say, read this and tell me how to, ch you, can you just change things if they're really bad? Because some edai, like some high up person had written it and they didn't want me to change it too much. And then after a couple of weeks, I realized that at, if you do that, then the English is terrible. And so I started being more assertive and saying, give, no, give me the Japanese original so I can do it properly. But at university, we did loads, loads of translation courses. And then I took translation courses while I was in Japan. So I don't have any formal qualifications, just random different little co courses. It's more I learnt while I was doing it. But if it's into English, that's not so hard. If someone asked me to translate into Japanese, while I was in that position, I'd have probably said, hmm, I'm not qualified, I can give it a go, but you know it's going to be terrible. So, yeah, I think if you study Japanese, that's not the same as studying translation. But if you do Japanese at university, both in Japan and in London, we, that was part of the course, you learn how to translate. I love that part, by the way, it's fun. <laughs> okay, any further questions? How, in, in, when you're working in Japan at that time, how, how do you feel about the, the stress, the, the amount of stress? The stress of working in Japan? Yeah. Goodness, I didn't find it very stressful at all. I had an amazing <coughs> office. My office was, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Nara. It's uh, this probably one of the best yeah. cities in Japan, just south of Osaka. And um, our office looked out on Todaiji, the biggest wooden building in the world with the giant bronze Buddha inside. And so it was amazing for culture. And just, yeah, no, the job was really fun. The most staff, some people worked really late, but there were part-time staff and um, the other CIRs that would leave at 5.30. And I worked hard, but I didn't find it stressful. Oh, I see, because I thought that in West Coast, I, was ex I thought I was expecting that, you know, in Japan, you have to work very extremely hard this afternoon. I think I would work hard during my hours. <laughs> And then I would do lots of socialising outside the hours. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the thing nomunication. This goes for university and if you want to work in Japan. It's basically you take the word nomu to drink and communication, and then you find that communication gets a lot better with the nomu side of things. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you'll learn to, um, yeah, you'll make really good friends with either other students or with colleagues at work. I did find that. It makes your Japanese a lot better as well. You'd be surprised. One little bit of sake, and your Japanese becomes far more fluent than you ever knew it could be. <laughs> and you become better at karaoke as well. I'm so much better at karaoke. <laughs> okay, any more questions? What do you mean, what kind of careers or...? Oh, no, just careers in general. Like the prospects of get, getting a career being international compared to, let's say, um, other local like, Japanese people. And, I mean, does it become, like, would we consider it so much or...? We, well, actually, we were discussing this just before we came in. Um, I actually saw um, a, a couple of months ago in The Times, they, um, the newspaper, it was listing the top degrees to study um, for how much money you make afterwards. And I was really surprised to see Japanese was number ninth. All the rest was lots of law and engineering and those kind of degrees. And Japanese was the only language in there. And I was thinking, what? Because I have to admit, quite often, if you want to use Japanese in London, especially for entry roles, they're not particularly well paid because they're normally local staff and then the managers are sent in from Japan. So if you want to work in the UK, they're not amazingly paid. But it's a really good way to get your foot in the door if, you're, if you want to get a job here. Because, for example, um, Douglas wanted to work in media. Yeah. So, you, you so <laughs> I mean, I've only been out of university for um, less than a year and a half. But when I graduated, I started working in the Japan Foundation in the arts and culture department. So Japanese obviously played a role in that. Um, and I was also translating for the Japan Society alongside that, which I still do, um, into English. Um, but then I moved from there, I moved to a production company in East London that has lots of Japanese clients. 
Um, so we were working for people like Asahi Beer, Panasonic, making commercials, doing shoots, but there was, again, a Japanese angle. And then when the Olympics came, I was working for Tokyo Broadcasting, so it was a very cool job. Again, Japanese was playing a role, but now I work for the London Philharmonia Orchestra in digital and PR, so it's very much what you make of it. And as Josie said, it's a foot in the door. And also, I mean, at the moment, the economy is very bad, and everyone's saying how bad the economy is, but if a recruiter has a pile of 150 CVs, even if there are 150, you're very likely to be the Japanese one, which means that probably they'll want to interview you just to talk about, you know, you're studying abroad and then probably, you know, we'll progress the role and so forth. Well, then so. if you want to work in Japan, the majority of my friends that went to university with me work in good jobs in Japan. There's a few of us that are back in the UK, but most people either worked in Japan or else have moved on to other international areas. There's lots of people in Singapore now too. So I think... It, it's really what you want to make of it, but it, it's one of those um, languages, as Warren said, it really opens doors, not just to Japan, but it opens your mind a little bit as well. I just want to say one thing. I think timing is one of the most important things because I originally started my job hunting in my third year um, in Japan, and I was looking to work in a Japanese company or in Japan specifically, and there was nothing at that point. Um, they all required you to speak fluent Japanese or at least business level and I wasn't um, ready at that time for that so that's why um, I actually decided to go to grad school and going to grad school I don't think that has made the difference it's just the timing so a lot of Japanese companies are looking to hire foreigners at this moment and so because I'm coming into the job market at the right time <laughs> it's been able to, I've been able to get a job because of that but you may have noticed in the news in the last um, couple of months, Japanese companies have been buying up so many European companies. So they're going to need liaisons in the future. So you're actually studying, if you're thinking of going to Japan now, you're probably in really good timing. And in the same way, Japanese firms in Japan often want international people to help them with to kind of internationalize their own staff. Exactly. So I have friends that were, I have a friend working for Hitachi to um, kind of train Japanese people for if they want to move abroad and for, yeah, those kind of things as well. So, yeah, or work for the, you can work for the universities in Japan. There's, I have quite a few friends that um, promote their universities in the G30 group, that kind of thing. There's, there's loads. I mean, taking Rakuten as an example, just briefly, you'll see Play.com is now Rakuten, Play.com, and they've actually mm -hmm. recently changed their entire operational language internally to English, even though they are a Japanese company. And so they have a huge recruitment drive, but people, you know, I mean, they're doing, I have a friend who did a Skype interview with them the other day. I mean, the jobs are all in Japan, but they are recruiting worldwide. So there is a lot. That's reflective of, I think, a general trend recently. Yeah. It can be. It goes up and down. <laughs> I don't know if that would be a biggie because a lot of my friends, I have friends from school, sorry, university, that went straight into work. I also have lots of friends that did the JET program. You can get your Japanese to a vaguely decent level. Um, level. I don't think, I can't imagine that would be that big of, of an obstacle. I, I think, I, I just want to, I think it, it depends what type of company you're looking to go mm. into. A lot of the um, traditional Japanese companies, I'd say they're looking for, sorry to use this term, but virgins. So they want people who have just fresh come out of university, so they'll train you and put their mindset, give you their mindset. Mm. So I think that's the type of person they're looking for. Um, but that's not to say that all companies are like that. Mm. So don't be discouraged. Well, I'm still a student. Yeah. I would be a fresh graduate. Yeah. It's just I'm a little bit more worldly than some <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly don't think that would be a big issue, especially if you're an excellent candidate. I, I would just go ignore your age, be Genki, and just... <laughs> okay, I think we had a question at the front here. Yeah. Um, grad school, you talked about programs. I don't know if you guys also looked at grad school. In Japan, specifically. Um, I have friends that did, but I haven't. Yeah, I mean, any experience you have is the program compliant. I think nearly all my friends that did um, grad school in Japan went through the Japanese embassy to do the MEXT scholarship. And um, the people that have done well from that normally um, 
if you find a professor in Japan that you want to study under, and then you need to persuade that professor that they want you. And it's good for them. They get a lot of funding for having the student studying with them. And that's the way to get that scholarship, basically. If you have someone already sorted, then you can fly through the application process. If you just go in without doing any research, then you probably wouldn't get the funding. So you have to really know what you want to do and then try and work out which professor you want to work with. And then, yeah. <laughs> so I know that doesn't sound particularly easy, but if, you're in the, if you choose a field, then you can work out all the professors and you read their works, that kind of thing. And then normally for those, you have to do intensive six months Japanese study or a year Japanese study before you start the course, unless you can choose an English language grad program. Okay. Um, I'm conscious of time, but I'm also aware that I've rather neglected the back of the room. I noticed a hand <laughs> up there. So maybe we can take uh, one last question. Yep. I think in answer to your first part of the question, in terms of the intensity of Japanese study in Japan, I, it varies <laughs> vastly depending on the university. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not that universities in Tokyo are really hard, and universities in the country you ride horses, it's not like that at all. It's very much, it, do, it does depend on university. Mm. University is the best way. I mean, if you want to study lots of Japanese, but at the same time have enough time to work, talk to some of your senpai. And you know, people have come back. You know, fourth years who have come back from Japan, and and base your decision on where to to study, at least in part, on that. But at the same time, I mean, at Waseda, we had what twenty contact hours a week, but lots of people did hold down part time jobs. And I mean, there is a limit I, when you apply for the extra visa. How long is it? Sixteen hours. That you, there's a limit to how long you can work on top of a student visa specifically. But and you don't need that many hours, especially if you're no. doing tutoring. Exactly. Tutoring, you can charge a good 3,500 3, yen, um, even for just talking Japanese, for, talking English for an hour. Um, and so, in, yeah, so part A, definitely look around. And part B, absolutely, it's, I mean, you, your English is fine. So, I mean, you it's, know. The only thing is persuading them that your English is fine. I had an Australian friend who had... Um, she, she, they basically said to her, but you, because she had an Asian face, and they were like, but how can you teach English? You don't look English. You don't look Australian. And so she had to really be like, no, I'm Australian, rah. So you might just have to put your foot down and say, no, my English is perfect. I'm perfectly capable of teaching English. So, yeah, you, you might just have to put your foot down. Okay. <laughs> well, one last question from the back. In terms of in, in Japan, is a yeah. part time. I think it can do. To be honest, I would like to say it would. It doesn't. But I've. I mean, um, it, there's the positive racism thing as well. I've definitely had people give me jobs without. I didn't think it was enough of an interview just because I turned up and I had a white face. But um, I think that's probably similar if you're black. To be honest, as it's more if. If you can persuade them and you say that you're English, I don't think you'll have a very big problem. When I um, was first looking for a part-time job, I was sending emails out to lots of places. And eventually I got the travel agency. But one of the places I um, sent an email to was a hotel, and they called me up on the phone for an interview. And they were like, um, so you're English? I was like, yeah, I'm from England. So you're white? And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you're Asian? No. <laughs> and then it eventually got down to what ethnic background I come from. And they were like, um, well, for this post, you would have to stand in front because it's a hotel, so I'll be a receptionist. So they don't want to give that image that it's too diverse. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> so for certain jobs, um, you may go to a convenience store and notice that a lot of the people working in convenience stores aren't actually Japanese. They may be from different mm -hmm. countries in Asia. But because they look Asian, they will get those jobs where they will be at the front. But if it's maybe some office jobs um, or English teaching, I don't I think, think it's going to... I think it's gonna, changing a lot, though. It's, yeah. I, I definitely noticed the last time I went, I was in Tokyo, <clears throat> I went to um, an onsen. It was one of the ones with the hot rocks. 
and none of the staff were Japanese, and they were all different colours, uh, but they all spoke to me in Japanese, and they didn't treat me any differently to a Japanese customer, and I was like, oh, not used to this, because in, in Kyoto, I had sometimes, you'd go to a convenience store, and if I asked people a question, they'd say, I don't speak English, and I'd be like, <laughs> like if even speaking in Japanese, they'd be like, I see your face, you yeah. can't speak Japanese, and I find that really, really, <laughs> it can be very frustrating. It is frustrating. But it seems to be getting better. I think, to be honest, that's the worst in places like Kyoto where it's very touristy because there's a lot of people that go there that don't speak Japanese, so they see your face panic, they just default, and then they, they just can't hear whatever you say. <laughs> so you'll, you'll get some of these moments. <laughs> and, and just briefly, in terms of work options, is this always... I always thought it was good to bear in mind that actually there are a lot of outposts of countries, of companies rather, in Japan that are not Japanese. And, you know, even if there are Japanese people working in the office, if the upper management is European or British, the culture does filter down. So it is very different. If you go and work in Mitsubishi's office in Tokyo, it would be very different to going and working in, you know, the Amazon distribution centre or something. So there is also that to think about. And if you are black, get ready for people to ask you if they can touch your hair. <laughs> <laughs> and put things in it as well. <laughs> or, or to liken you to Eddie Murphy, I believe. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, OK. Um, let's wrap up, maybe, uh, with uh, a message to all the people here uh, thinking of, of going out to Japan. So just a, a few words. A few words. Uh, <laughs> Have I put you on the spot horribly? It's fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, in brief, I would just say, go for it. And studying Japan was the best thing I ever did, g genuinely. And it's put me exactly where I want to be career-wise. Mm -hmm. And I think the, th the mistake people make sometimes when they've studied Japanese and they graduate is they, it, they feel that it's narrowed their options and they don't apply for a broad range of jobs. But actually, you can pretty much make it do whatever you want it to do in terms of career. And I think that's very important to bear in mind. That would be my little soundbite there. Mine would be, um, remember that the challenges are actually quite often the most important parts. If it was all easy sailing, you'd be incredibly boring. And then when you come back to the UK, you'd have nothing to throw out when people ask you in job interviews. So tell us about a challenge that you've overcome. If you go to Japan, I promise there will be quite a few challenges. <laughs> but getting over them, it's so fantastic when you get over any kind of problem that you're having. And you learn so much more from any bumps in the road. So yeah, give it a go. <laughs> um, I'd say learn, if you do Japanese, it's not just about learning the language and being able to speak Japanese. It's being able to communicate with mm -hmm. Japanese people. You really need to analyze the way they interact with each other. And I think if you can do that, they will start being in Japan the Japanese people may start to accept you a lot more um, and they will take you to places and it, it opens so many different things that you can do. So don't just learn the language, really analyse and just try and see how they communicate with each other. Okay, thanks very much. So that's the, uh, the end of the, the final seminar for today. I think we've got about 15 minutes of the event left. So uh, if you still haven't been to the main hall, all the booths in there, then... Uh, Get your way over there now. Okay, I have one more big round of applause for our participants. Thank you.